My name is Robin. Uh, I was raised in a little uh, town in Holland, in a little mining town. Very working class family. Uh, my father is a policeman. My grandfather uh, is a miner. I grew up in one of those neighborhoods that were built post-war. They were built by the mine. You know, it's one of those neighborhoods like you see in the movie Billy Elliot. It's, uh, you know, we all have the same garden, the same uh, orange awning, the same car. The only thing that differentiates the houses is the, the names on the, on the mailboxes. I was mostly raised by my grandparents because my parents were working every day. So I would be dropped off in the morning and be picked up in the evening. And so I was always with my grandparents and with the neighbors of my grandparents. And the neighbors of my grandparents were all of the same age as my grandparents. So it kind of exposed me to, to a different generation than that was mine. I grew up in a way out of time. Something that was really important to me as a child was world building in a sense. It's something I, I do now to today. It's uh, I always needed an escape. I, I never had a lot of friends. I, I never really fitted in. So creating a world of my own was very important to me. I, I, at my grandparents, you know, I, there was the attic. You know, I, it was like this, this almost this religious, um, uh, how do you say it, uh, ceremony or something. Like uh, there was this hatch in the, in the ceiling and they would pull down the, the foldable ladder and I would climb up. And in the attic, it was filled with uh, four generations basically of stuff. My grandparents never threw anything away. So you, you had furniture, you had uh, personal objects, you had toys that belonged to my grandparents, to my parents, even stuff from my great grandparents. So it was like a cavern of Alibaba. I always had this need to, to, to build my own world, you know, like even with my, my, my grandmother, I was always playing, you know, board games or I was drawing and it was never enough to just play the board game. I, I had to adapt the whole house. I had, I had this board game, which I was really obsessed with. It was like a, a haunted mansion and it was not enough to just play the game. I had to close all the curtains. I had to like light a hundred candles. I had to put on the soundtrack of, uh, of Dracula from Francis Ford Coppola, you know, like I had to, I had to be immersed. Or with my grandfather, I, I would be, um, after school, I would go with my grandfather working on our projects in the shed. And uh, for example, we were building the city of Jerusalem and we would do everything. He, like he was very, cre he's very creative, my grandfather. It's, it's really, it's really uh, astonishing. Like we would build these little houses like you would see in, in pictures of Jerusalem, you know, with the little cupolas and the little sticks, you know, and we would carve every brick and we would even set fire to the roofs of the shanty houses of the shepherds. And then when Christmas would come, like we, the whole house would be taken over, like it would be in front, underneath every window, uh, over the television, over the dining table, like it, nothing would be crazy enough for my grandparents. And I, I always had to go bigger. It always had to be bigger, 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 bigger. And uh, yeah, and so uh, something I do still today. When I was little, I really knew what I wanted to do. It was, it was never even a question, you know, like I knew I wanted to, to create in a, in a sense, you know, uh, maybe that got muddied when I became a teenager because, you know, in high school, the teachers, they're not very uh, supportive of you being creative or being this or being different or, but in the end, I'm, I've come back exactly to who I was as a child. It's, it's, it's identical. And also the references that I encountered as a child, for example, I had this VHS tape of the Muppet movie, which was like, I rerun that movie like a thousand times. I watched it like the original Muppet movie from Jim Henson. And in the movie, you have Kermit who goes on a quest to find his friends and to, you see how, how the Muppets were created. And at the end of the movie, you have the, the big finale, the final song. And it's the big finale of a movie in a movie. If, if you have seen the movie, it's a, and Kermit, he starts off over the rainbow and everybody starts joining in and suddenly all the set design around him starts crashing down and, 
everything is ruined. But the Muppets, you know, they don't miss a beat, you know, they, they keep on going, you know, they keep on singing and they change the song and they start singing like, life is a movie, write your own ending, keep believing, keep pretending. And I think those words were something that were so fundamental to me when I was little. Uh, it was very important to me and it, it, it just showed me uh, the possibilities in a sense, you know, to, to keep on going and keep pretending and one day... Uh, you'll get somewhere. I think it's very important to, for a child to, to, to hear that. I had such a bad experience uh, at school that I just never wanted to go back. Uh, I, just, I never wanted to have to deal with this type of authority again or this type of like rules. So not going to an art school was just natural to me. You know, it never even, I never even question that it was just something I always drew when I was little. I always created stuff when I was little. I didn't have the techniques, but when I really decided, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to be an artist, you know, I, I just I just went to YouTube and uh, basically you can find everything there. And uh, I just do my research and, uh, you know, my first show was, was a very violent show. It was called Endgame and it was all big drawings, you know, ballpoint pen, which came very natural to me because it was something I was doing in school anyway. I was always like uh, doodling in my notebooks and drawing. And, and so from there on, I kind of took it further. I, I knew I, at the time I was doing hyperrealistic sculptures and I knew at the time that's something I really wanted to do. So, and I had no experience making a hyperrealistic sculpture or working with silicon or I had no clue, you know. So what I did is I, I would buy every book, you know, of artists out there that would work hyperrealistically, like Ron Muek, like Mauricio Catalan, uh, like Duan Hansen, and I would look, you know, uh, in the backstage pictures, I would look through the documentaries on them, what were the products they had lying around, you know, like I would buy those products, I would research those products, and little by little I taught myself how to do it. But if you first see my first sculpture, Do You Believe in God, which is a very important sculpture to me because it's kind of representing me, um, it's, it's very rough still underneath the clothes. Uh, the hair, I punched in the hair myself, I, I painted it myself, I did everything, but of course, you know, they were the first ones. I think the reason why my works reference imagery that are related to the United States or to the American dream, it's because when I was little, I would come home from school and Davy Crockett was waiting for me, you know, and I would join his adventures or I would come home from school and there was an after school special and I would join my friends in, this, in their American high school. So I think through the references that were fed to me through television and I think my generation and a lot of generations all over the world, a lot of kids all over the world, we share the same references in a sense, you know, because these American imagery were coming to us in our living room. They were unescapable. It's, it's impossible to unprogram us. And I think all these imagery are referencing, of course, the American dream, even though we didn't realize that as a child. I think we were influenced by that. Even though I didn't know what the American dream meant, I knew it was important. I knew what they were talking about in those television shows when like Saved by the Bell or stuff like that, you know. There were all these life lessons in there. There were all these values and morals that we were taught. And, you know, again, it's, it's impossible to unprogram that. I think, you know, I learned my values through American television. So, yeah, it's, it's only natural that now I reference them in my, in my work. I discovered the works of Harmony Corinne and like Chris Cunningham and Larry Clark when I was in high school. And especially because I was really uh, such an outsider, it was something that I found my refuge in. And in a way, these artists, they took the imagery that I reference and they twisted it, you know, they showed that there was this nightmare lurking beyond the suburban um, household. They, they, they were really building on that and it was really, um, I found a lot of refuge, refuge in these artists, in the work of these artists. I think everybody uh, felt like after the lockdowns, things were going to be different. Things are, people were going to be nicer. The world was going to be a better place. Uh, people were going to become an end in themselves and not a means to an end. 
And I think there is a real deception after that. I feel like things are only getting worse. I think also my generation is dealing with so much more than past generations ever did. I think we have climate change, we have pending wars, we have uh, uh, the fear of artificial intelligence. Uh, like it's really, it's, it's quite overwhelming. At the same time, we are bombarded with millions and millions and millions of, of, of imagery and inputs and things we have to be, things we have to consume, things we have to uh, become, uh, to be good, to be valued, to be important in this world, to be seen. I think it's very confusing. I think my work also uh, um, um, translates that, especially my previous show, It's All Your Fault. It was really about the massive flow of imagery that comes towards us on a daily basis, and everything comes towards us at the same level you know nothing uh, has priority anymore everything is as important you know from from the news of the kardashians to uh, global news to to i don't know a war raging in, in the other side of the world you know everything is is, is, is messed up it's 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 confused. I'm confused. It's uh, uh, I think my work uh, talks about that. Since I entered this gallery, Templon, which of course has a, has a has a history uh, with pop artists because it was founded in the '60s, and the founder Daniel Templon was a good friends with Leo Castelli, and so all the artists that were happening in New York at the time, from Rauschenberg to Jim Dine, they would all be exposed. In, in his gallery here in Paris. Um, since then, I've been really kind of obsessed with artists from that time era. We, of course, are referencing the same imagery. Uh, we are referencing consumer imagery. Uh, so in that way, I'm, 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 I identify with pop art. Uh, on the other hand, I maybe identify more with um, capitalist realist, which was the counter movement that was in Europe in the 60s which contained uh, Gerhard Richter, which was, of course, a play on uh, socialist realism from the, from the Soviet Union, which was all about glorification of this, uh, these leaders. And so these capitalist realists did, did the same thing, but they did it with consumer products. It was the, the glorification of consumer products. This work, this series, Kingdom of Ants, um, is influenced a lot by the work of uh, Robert Rauschenberg and his combines, and of Jim Dine, uh, who were the pioneers of creating works that were not flat. They were invading the viewer space because he they would attach objects to it. I think it's something natural for me to continue this type of work or this tradition, as you uh, might call it, um, because it reminds me of my play sets when I was little. You know, you would go into the, the toy store and you would buy a playset and you would have a, a background and you could attach things to it. And, uh, so my works today are kind of built like a playset, like a toy. You know, you can play with them, you can move things around. I think in my work it's important that there is a certain entertainment factor because I think it's important for me to speak to to everybody. I don't only want to speak to people who have a certain education and who can decipher uh, certain elements in the work is because they are familiar with this type of idea of the white cube gallery. You know, I, I'm, I'm intentionally using imagery that people know that people have a certain emotion uh, about. Imagery that, you know, as they would say about Andy Wall, imagery that already belongs to the audience. I think there is, of course, a manipulation on my side to do that, the same way that advertisements using those image, uses those imagery. It's because it evokes an emotion within the audience. And then I like to build upon that. I like to take that emotion that I know that is already present within the viewer and push it further, push it into the direction I want it to go. You know, I want to question that emotion that they are feeling. I want to question uh, within them, I want them to think, you know, is that emotion and I'm feeling a, a right emotion or not, you know. For this, uh, for this show, Kingdom of Ants, uh, I had a few goals in mind. Uh, one thing was that I wanted to create um, 
works that would function as a commercial billboard. I wanted works that felt like an advertisement uh, in a sense. Um, I also at the same time wanted to create a, a system that felt toy-like, that people could uh, continue to play with and that people can change even you know, uh, in the future. Uh, they can change themselves, they can move things around, they can uh, add things, they can remove things. I think the sentiment of the show, it's, it's really, uh, it talks about my need for escape. It talks about my need for, for nostalgia. I think it's a, it's a need that is shared by my generation. You can see it within, uh, within the trends that are today of going back to the 90s, that going back to the 80s, going back to the 70s, you can see it. Uh, in a lot of different uh, things, you can see it within movies, you know, everybody's remaking everything. It's all about remaking this, remaking that. I think uh, this whole time is about that. I think nobody's really creating anything new anymore. And in a way, my work isn't either. I'm reusing stuff, uh, stuff that were given to me through television, through the internet, through thing, and I'm, I'm recycling it into... Uh, into something new, into something that uh, hopefully provokes the, uh, the viewer. Most of the works contain imagery that are memories in a way, but at the same time they are memories that a lot of people will share all over the world. These are imageries, th these images were the images on our toys, these images come from the movies we saw when we were little. These images come from uh, advertisements. Uh, these are images that make me feel safe. These are images that make me think that the future can only be better. I think that in that point, this promise that the future can only be better lies the essence of my show. I think the show is about the disillusionment of that promise because it doesn't look like it's going better. It only looks like it's going worse. Um, that's why I'm clashing it with uh, these materials like stainless steel, like aluminium, to symbolize this, this, this rupture between uh, promises made and promises broken. This show tells a story, every room tells a story. Um, I like to take the, the uh, visitor on a on a voyage you know I like to and in the same way uh, uh, Walt Disney took us on a voyage uh, through Pirates of the Caribbean it's a storytelling that I'm interested in the reason I I spent so much time in the production of the work and the creation of the works and the reason why I I paint the paintings in oil paint uh, is because I think all the, the toys that I had as a, as a child, especially those of the time of my grandparents, they were very richly illustrated, you know, they were very generous. They were not uh, bare like you see certain mangas today or certain uh, thing. And I really relate to uh, Mike Kelly, uh, to the title of Mike Kelly's work, so many lo love hours that can never be repaid. You know, I think it's very interesting because it reminds me uh, of my grandmother, you know, like making stuff by hand, you know, knitting and stuff like that. And it was very underappreciated all the time that she, she spent on that and all the, the work that went in it or my grandfather, you know, making stuff that people didn't really appreciate how, how difficult it was and how, and how much work went into that. And I think it's the same for me, you know, I really took on that, um, that need to put a lot of time and effort into the work because I don't want it to be easy. I don't want it to be um, gratuitous. I, I want the audience, if, if somebody takes the time to uh, go out of their house and come see my work, I want to be generous to them. I want them to have an experience and I want them to leave with a feeling of, uh, of enrichment.